But, you know, I, I think with players like Pasta, Mark, you've got to take the good with the bad. You've got to take the sort of turnovers or the plays that don't work out every once in a while for the nights like last night where he just, you know, throws the team on his shoulders and scores three goals. And to mix point, is able to score 50 goals this year on a team that's, I think, significantly less offensive talented than uh, the 60 goal season he put up last year. Welcome to another edition of the Pucks with Hags podcast. As always, I'm your host, Joe Haggerty. You can find my work at joehaggerty.substack.com. Uh, sign up for a premium membership, and you will get all of my Bruins and NHL writing sent straight directly to your inbox. I also write columns after every Bruins game for Boston Sports Journal. Uh, so check out bostonsportsjournal.com and check out all the good stuff there. As always, Pucks with Hags is powered by Prize Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. Today, I'm joined by Mark Diver from the New England Hockey Journal. Mark, how's it going, bud? It's going good, Joe. How about you? Excellent. You know, just uh, cranking along here. Uh, the end of the hockey season, the youth hockey season is coming. Uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs are coming. It's a great time of year. Uh, actually, no better time of year to get involved with uh, with Prize Picks. Uh, the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks. You simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in. For example, David Pasternak, you can pick shots on net. Charlie McAvoy, block shots. You can do hits. You can do goals, assists, all that stuff, and do more or less with each one. It's fun and pretty simple. Download the Prize Picks app today. And use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's download the Prize Picks app today, and it's super easy to use. I downloaded it a, a couple weeks ago. And use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right. Um, hot off a uh, 6-2 win over the Ottawa Senators on Tuesday night. Um, I, I, I got to say, my lately, I've really liked... Uh, how the Bruins have picked up their game against the sort of lesser uh, opponents in the league uh, from the NHL all-star break. It seemed like they went a month and if they were play, playing a team that was out of the playoffs, you were getting kind of a envelope and a bunch of stamps and kind of a mailed in effort from them. Uh, that wasn't them uh, wasn't indicative of the way that they've played most of the year and, and was kind of, you know, tough to watch as they were slogging through uh, February um, that's a solid six to two win on Tuesday night against the Ottawa Senators, Senators team, obviously not going to the playoffs where they just looked very solid all around. Yeah, I, I agree. And, uh, I like, uh, it seems like things have solidified a bit since the trade deadline, you know, yep. I think the peak, the under kind of under the radar peak acquisition, it, it was turn is turning out to be a good one. Now it's only been a handful of games, but. You know, I'm I'm ready to uh, to uh, give credit to the Bruins pro scouting department once again for finding yeah. the guy that people say, well, look at his numbers in Columbus. He hardly plays, and but in actuality, he's a he's a solid player in a different kind of system. Uh, and then the fourth line, uh, you know, Brazo, Boquist, Beecher uh, on any given night, you know, very good last night. Um, and, and for several games now. So I think that's solidified the lineup. Jake DeBrusque has a little little spark uh, knowing that he's not going anywhere uh, yep. for the time being. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. And, you know, it's the home stretch here. They they got to get their uh, their act uh, together here going into, into the postseason. Yeah, I would say uh, DeBrusque. Matt Grizzlick, Lena Selmark, I think all the guys that we talked about as potentially moving at the trade deadline or, or being looked at as uh, players that might have to move to create salary cap space, I think they've all played pretty well since the trade deadline uh, with that kind of confidence knowing that they're going to be here and that they didn't end up getting moved and that sort of stress and anxiety uh, removed you know, from the equation. I, I look at all of them as players that uh, look like they're playing a much more relaxed themselves version uh, of their game since the trade deadline. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, this next game is, uh, you know, a, a test. Obviously, the Rangers, one of the top teams, and a team that uh, 
you know, the Bruins might have to go through uh, to get, you know, to advance in the postseason down the road. Uh, yep. You know, they're not the Ottawa Senators, that's for sure. Uh, so it'll be a fun one. It should be a fun one on Thursday night. It should be, and I'm glad the Bruins are playing at a, at a good high level now going into that game. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned Andrew Peak because I thought he was uh, – he's been solid, and I thought he was excellent uh, yeah. in that game against Ottawa. Uh, he put a, a lick on uh, Brady Kachuk at one point in that game, uh, really put a body on him. Uh, he was making it really unpleasant to get around the net. He took an interference penalty, but I didn't even think that was a penalty, and I was totally okay with – uh, exactly what happened on that play like he looks like the kind of player that doesn't mind making it tough uh, if you're going to try to go around the Bruins net plays up to his size and strength uh, and isn't afraid to mix it up and you know I, I know some people in Columbus were talking about like Peak was going to get bought out of his contract up there like you know they were like high-fiving each other over getting a third round pick for him but like I think I agree with you. And I said it at the time when they made the trade, like I have total faith at this point in the advanced scouts for the Bruins, the NHL scouts for the Bruins, that when they see guys like this, they see something where the guy is going to work in the Bruins system or with the Bruins coaching staff, uh, where they're going to be able to make something of that player and, and certainly make them useful. And we've seen it over and over again, like all the guys, uh, you know, the guys that are on the fourth line, the Boquist, Boquists and the uh, Brazos of the world, um anthony richard when he was up like the players that they go out and get from other organizations um they come in and they do really well with the bruins and it seems like over and over again they target the right players and they, and they find a good fit for the Bruins system yeah and it helps that the bruins have a structure that other teams don't necessarily have correct uh and that helps uh a guy like peak who doesn't have to doesn't have to you know, do too much, uh, you know, just play within the, somebody put it to me a while ago about, uh, about Wotherspoon, stay within the guardrails, right? Stay within the guardrails, you know, don't, uh, don't veer off, uh, unnecessarily. If you do that in, in the Bruin system, you know, that works for a lot of guys. Uh, two goals last night for Justin Brazo. Um, you know, he continues, and he's, he could have more. He had one called back uh, recently in a game. Uh, he's had some really good chances. I think consistently he's had pretty good chances around the net. Uh, and really, like, when you watch him play for a little while, you get an appreciation for who and what he is and that he doesn't really, I think, have a lot of misunderstanding about who and what he is. He's like the classic – he's got the classic big man's game around the net. You know, try yeah. to get it close to the net – you make those couple of quick stick moves that he pre like that one stick move where he goes, you know, backhand forehand and then, and shoots right away uh, in front of the net and, and makes that move from the side of the net. He probably, he must pra have been practicing that for the last 10 or 15 years. It just feels automatic when he does it. Um, it seems like he practiced the exact right things and he's uh, perfected the right things that he has to, in order to be effective at the NHL level. And like he gets to the front of the net and he's able to stay there because he's massive and, you know, teams are not being able to get him out of the way right now. And it, it to the point where, you know, the Bruins put him on the net front on the power play and he scored a goal last night in that situation. That's a lot of confidence in a fourth liner to sort of put him in that role. And it looks like, you know, it's funny watching him with JVR. They're obviously different kinds of players, but he has a lot of the same kind of sort of low post or low, low net moves that JVR yeah. does yep. as far as what he does with the stick and the little, the little plays that he makes. Yeah. And you know, the, the uh the backhand forehand at the net you know if you if you watch providence the last few years you saw that at least twice a game from him uh around the net now you know it doesn't go in every time and goalies right. uh after it doesn't take long for goalies to realize what's coming they know they know what he's going to do but uh you know it's, it's a solid uh, play at the net and uh you know he was always the guy who stayed out a long time after practice, practicing tips and plays around the net. But one thing I think that really uh, stands him in good stead is that he's an older guy. He's mature. Yeah. He's not He's not uh, living and dying with every shift. And if the coach gives him a dirty look <laughs> after one shift, you know, he's not, he's not uh, 
taken that to heart too much. He's a mature guy. He knows, uh, you know, after he, he, he's had some time in pro hockey here, he knows that, you know, keep your nose to the grindstone. Do do what you do. Uh, just keep consistently trying to to work uh, at what you're good at and uh, and things will uh, things will work out for you. And it's it's happening right before our eyes here. It's funny too, um, when he was first brought up and like, you know, the, the people that sort of pretend like they know uh, everything that's going on with the Bruins organization <laughs> would talk about how slow he was and how this isn't an NHL skater and, you know, kind of ripping the, the con him signing the contract and all that other stuff. And it's like, you know, obviously a guy that's six foot five and well over 200 pounds is not going to be Jesper Boquist, like flying up and down yeah. the ice, Johnny yeah. Beecher, like flying up and down the ice and showing with breathtaking speed. But I think he's shown the ability to keep pace, which is all he has to do, uh, given what he brings to the table, because like those kind of guys that are speed guys are not going to be able to do what he does camping around yeah. the net, carving out space, winning battles, like, you know, the first goal that he scored, he went so hard to the net that he knocked Ryan Suter's stick out of his hands and went flying up in the air. Like, that told me all I needed to know right then and there yeah. when he yeah. was able to do that to a guy that's, you know, uh, an NHL pro for a long time, one of the best defensemen and has been for a while. Uh, to be able to do that to a guy like that lets you know how hard he is going to the net and how strong he is. Yeah. And, you know, he he's more than adequate speed-wise to, to play the kind of game that he is. Yeah, and it, you know, before he uh, before they made that move and signed him, uh, I had a couple of pe pro uh, scout types say to me that you know, if he's as fast or faster than JVR, right? You know, so it looks different because of the size and you know, guys uh, guys that are that big don't have uh, you know a skating stride that that jumps out like like a bulk whist or right. a here but uh he gets there he gets there and that's the important thing football season may be over but the action on the floor is heating up whether it's a tournament season or the fight for a playoff home court there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year get in on the excitement with prize picks america's number one fantasy sports app where you could turn your hoops knowledge into serious cash. Testing my skills on prize picks this season is the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $1,000 with just a few taps. Prize picks is really simple to play, and I can make my picks and submit my entry in less than 60 seconds. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Use the code CLNS for the first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Uh, hat trick uh, for David Posternak last night. Pretty funny. Uh, that bear hat uh, that he picked up after the game was over. Uh, and I guess apparently it was cool. He, he talked about how um, the fans came down to the bench after the game was over and he gave them a stick, uh, whoever threw that bear hat on the ice. Cause that, that must've been pretty, uh, that must've been an accomplishment and a little bit of a project to get that over the glass and onto the ice. I can't imagine how that, uh, the mechanics of that happened. Um, but it was pretty funny to see that, um, David Pasternak now looks like he's probably going to get to 50 goals again this year for the second straight year. And then last night, uh, one of the goals that he scored, uh, passes Cam Neely on the franchise all-time uh, goal scored list. And it's funny, we had that uh, centennial committee at the uh, start of the year and talked about the centennial team and all that stuff. And I remember getting a lot of pushback for Pasternak being on that centennial team because people thought he was too young. Uh, his career was midstream. Like, you know, he, he hasn't accomplished enough yet as compared to some other players. Um, you know, it, it, he doesn't really deserve to be on there. That was some people's take. Um, and like when you start passing and you, you saw this coming at the beginning of the year, you know, obviously he's one of the elite scorers in the league, one of the elite scorers in Bruins history, you know, up there with the Espos, Rick Middleton's guys like that, that, uh, you know, were, were pure goal scorers. Um, but you know, when you're passing guys like Cam Neely, Hall of Famers on all-time franchise goal list for the Bruins and doing things like that, clearly you obviously belong uh, to be on that kind of a list. 
uh, and, you know, certainly I think he belongs to be uh, in the Hart Trophy conversation along with a lot of other players this year. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I mean, he's just, uh, he's just so much fun to watch, uh, you know, and, and, you know, after the game, he puts on that bear thing and, you know, <laughs> these pictures go out, it, you know, it's, it's great. It's yep. entertainment, right? That's what we're, uh, that's what we come, come to see is, uh, is, is the entertainment value. And he certainly, uh, he delivers that and, uh, you know, the bear thing. I mean, who, uh, you know, you, you love Bruins fans, right? Because you never know what you're going to see at, at a game, but yeah. who comes to the game wearing that thing? You know, I, <laughs> I, I, if I, if you're, well, saying, I, I, I tell you, Mark, I heard from my inside sources that it was somebody from Stoneham, which is the town that I'm <laughs> from. So it, it kind of explains a lot that somebody from Stoneham was able to sneak that bear hat. All right. Uh, well, there, the garden there you and go. Throw it on there the ice. Uh, <laughs> the first thing I thought of was that Seinfeld episode where Putty comes with the fur coat and uh, <laughs> and Elaine introduces him as Doctor Zayas from <laughs> <laughs> Planet of the Apes. That's my. That was my first thought when I saw that. Well, I thought it was a fur coat too when I first saw it tossed <laughs> on the ice. I didn't know what the heck it was a bear pelt or a fur coat or yeah. what the heck was going on there. Uh, but as soon as you saw it on the ice, you're like, oh, all right, 88's going to go find that. He's going to make <laughs> make uh, make this a fun moment. Uh, Mick, we're talking about Pasternak and uh, Mick Collagio. Actually, Mick, why don't you just plug everything real quick? Uh, tell everybody where they can get your work, and then we'll get right into it. Sure. Um, I, I blog at home games, uh, rink wrap. I, I link it to X Twitter. Um, I can be seen in the hockey news, seasonal issues on um, prospects, future watch, money power, yearbook, and uh, writing the Bruins end of it. And I also write a Sunday call for bostonhockeynow.com. Awesome. Uh, and thank you for joining us. As always, Mick Collagio. Uh, just passed uh, the hat trick last night. No one-timers. Uh, scored the goals in different ways last night, uh, which uh, – I appreciated. Uh, we were talking. I was talking just now about the Centennial Committee that we were on, Mick, and how there was some pushback. Some people didn't think Pasta deserved to be on there or should be on there. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, he passes Cam Neely on the franchise all-time goal scored list last night. You know that that was one of the things that happened this year. But you could see the stuff coming at the beginning of the year, and I think when you kind of looked at the numbers he had put up, what he's going to continue to do. I felt like he was a slam dunk to be on there. When you start passing Hall of Famers on scoring lists, like you should absolutely be there. Um, you know, just your thoughts on Pasta this year. You know, career high in assists this year. Seems to be making more plays than ever before as well. In addition to scoring the goals, looks like he's going to hit 50 goals uh, again this year. Um, just what you've seen out of him this season, any different than the past and, and what you took of his performance last night. Well, the last time we finished, he had made a, a pass against at Montreal that just blew my mind. Yeah, he, he, he weaved the puck through three players at like one mile an hour to Brad Marchand, uh, who he saw for, with eyes that were in the back of his head. And uh, and and then, but he has this other thing he does where he releases the puck at whatever moment he decides as he whips it around from behind his body. And he can do it slow. He can do it fast. He can decide it's a pass. He can put it in any direction. He keeps on inventing ways to score. I remember thinking when Pasta was a very young player that he's going to be probably not, because he's not blinding fast, that he's probably going to be more Yager or Alfredson than he is, you know, more of a puck possession monster than he is, a you know, a, Val a, a Pablo Bure or something. So, uh, uh, to watch him evolve into his own man and and invent hockey up the ice as he goes. Mark Savard invented hockey as he played. Adam Oates invented hockey as he played. Pasta's amazing in the way he invents the game as a player who creates shots, creates plays, and he has to create more plays because because – with the Bruins down the amount of people that they didn't have from last year, it, you, the starting point for any coach was 
let's not let this guy beat us. It was almost like a basketball game. And 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 forced their and let's find out what the rest of them got. First of all, don't let him beat you. Well, he beats everybody anyway. He still does it. And and he's having a big finish. And yeah, I got the feeling uh, as soon as I saw that he had a second goal last night, I wasn't able to be uh, cover the game, uh, that, uh, that he's going to finish hard and go, go get 50 anyway, which yeah. is going to be, to me, a bigger feat than getting 60 last season. Historically, the 60 will stand out. But to me, uh, the 50 this year is a bigger deal in his career, uh, knowing close up what he's been up against and how much people have tried to hit him, discourage him, get on yep. him, hack his hands. And, and uh, you know, and really, he, you know, uh, I've seen other great player, great talents, I should say, uh, Wil Wilt. Uh, I, I remember Rosie Ruziska, you know, and what a great talent he was, but when this kind of stuff happened to him, he he complained to the refs and he went away and he stopped being a good player. And um, at Pasta, that hasn't been the case. He's battled through, and I, I feel a lot you know better about him being on on the uh, on the, the all time twenty than I did uh, the day we sat down to do it because I was just constitutionally against. Uh, Lionel Hitchman not making the team. That was my right. thing. It wasn't anti-pasta as much as it was, this is wrong. we got to get this part right. And that's why I wanted Dick Clapper at forward. But uh, but uh, that's uh, that that aside, uh, good for pasta. He's doing, he's he's really living up to his contract and he's and he's playing to win. And that's what you want to see uh, from, from a guy who gets paid like he does. Yeah, and becoming more of a leader too. I think more yep. and more he be, he's become a leader on that team. And uh, you know, you're absolutely right. He's not he's not a burner. Like he's a good skater, but he's not like a speed burner by any mean and means. And that's not really where his offense comes from. But like it comes from the creativity, and it comes from the willingness to take risks and be creative to make plays and take risks to uh, to make plays, which would all the great offensive players do. And that's why I don't get so worked up like. Some people do on Twitter and Bruins fans when you talk to them about some of the turnovers and some of the plays that don't happen or blow up on them. Uh, you know, obviously, I think it's always a concern when the play, uh, the power play rotation turns into him at the high point all by himself. You know, that there are times when when he's got the puck out there in that kind of a situation where it, it, just, too. it turns into something just yeah. pretty bad. Like, and you always, you know, you're, you're wondering, he's kind of walking that tightrope when he's out there, you know, that risk element, that big risk element is always there. But, you know, I, I think with players like pasta, Mark, you've got to take the good with the bad. You've got to take the sort of turnovers or the plays that don't work out every once in a while for the nights like last night, where he just, you know, throws the team on his shoulders and scores three goals. And to mix point, is able to score 50 goals this year on a team that's, I think, significantly less offensive talented than uh, the 60 goal season he put up last year. Yeah, you, you do. You got to take the good with the bad uh, uh, and and realize that there's a lot more good than there is bad. And, uh, you know, um, you know, the playoffs will be a test as it always is. Uh, you know, teams will, uh, will uh, lock down on him even more. And uh, that will be, uh, you know, how he responds to that and how the team responds to that will go a long way to deciding, you know, how the season ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And and we see that towards the end of the year too, right? When they, the teams definitely start getting more physical too with players like Postnet, Marsh, and really start pushing them around. It's not as, uh, as gentlemanly as it can be for long stretches of the regular yeah. season where <laughs> – you know, they're not taking runs at each other. Uh, but I think you start to see that now for sure. Uh, Kevin Shattenkirk, uh, good game last night. I think notable game, uh, worth talking about. Three assists, um, 16 minutes, played his offside um, and had been scratched for, for a game or two and, and comes back with a nice response there. And I think performing like that on his offside, Mick, um, you know, gives him another sort of like, area to help out Jim Montgomery depth wise, or, you know, making sure he can get into the lineup at certain points uh, when it comes playoff time, if that becomes an option that they can use. It is funny how, I mean, uh, here, here it comes folks. Peak performance by Shattenkirk. 
<laughs> I, I, he's obviously been a little a little motivated by the acquisition of a of a right shot who comes much more in an Adam McQuaid type mode yeah. than than mold than than the way he plays is completely different hockey widget, which gives Monty that kind of option as well as what do we need against this team in this playoff series? What do we need more of? And uh, and that allows because Shattenkirk. Uh, he is a mental wizard out there. He just uh, he's 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 just such a skilled skilled player that even at his advanced years and and uh, not being big, not being fast, he's crafty. And um, and and you know, I, and if he's not getting overwhelmed defensively, that's the biggie as far as whether or not he can sustain a spot in the lineup during a series. But, um, you know, you don't know. Maybe you need more of what Pete's going to do. But, yeah, you're right. He's got the skill to play the other side, too. He's an improviser. And that's who he's had to be throughout his whole career. So I've really enjoyed appreciating Shat and Kirk during this season. Um, I wouldn't have gone and gotten a player like him. I would have been I would have been much more about getting a player like Pete to, off the off the hop. But um, I'm glad they have the option and uh, and good for good for Shat and Kirk. Uh, I hope this doesn't sideline uh, Waterspoon um, going forward as the formula. I hope that's not the default position. I really think that kid has given them too much for them to uh, to to you know put him at the seven spot um, and cement it. But um, I really uh, uh, I like uh, I like I like what Chat and Kirk uh, his response games been. It was excellent. Yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, uh, Mark and I already talked a little bit about Andrew Peak off the top of the show. Uh, definitely want to get your thoughts, too, uh, really quickly. But, like, we were, you know, impressed with what he's brought. Certainly, uh, we gave kudos to the advanced scouts with the Bruins, the NHL scouts that, you know, saw something in him. The, the, the people, the talent evaluators that looked at him and thought in the Bruins system with the Bruins coaches, uh, he'd be a really effective piece. Um, you know, I thought he was played great last night. That might have been his best game. Um, certainly, I like the play where he set up Beecher for the goal because it looked like you know, even making that kind of a play was something uh, it wasn't even as advertised that he could make that play. Um, you know, coming here as far as what he could do offensively, you know, chipping in every once in a while or making a play. Uh, but you know, threw a big hit on Brady Kachuk, had that play, which I didn't even think was interference at the net, but like looks like he's the kind of D that is going to make trying to get around the net front uh, a very unpleasant place for opponents to get to, which is, you know, exactly the kind of player that they, they needed uh, on the back end, a big, strong guy that plays with a little bit of mean. I know I've been, I've been really kind of weary over this several years here of hearing that a guy is a prototypical Bruin. And I'm thinking how many prototypical Bruins do the Bruins have? And, yeah. and uh, they need more prototypical Bruins. Yeah. Now, ironically, they've been a team without enough prototypical Bruins when it comes to the playoffs in, in front of either net. And uh, it's nice to see them inch their way forward here. I would have been more appreciated something more dramatic. Uh, but this is, uh, but right now, beggars can't be choosers. Um, I'm happy to see them. We do have Factor Meals uh, to help us out. America's number one ready to eat meal kit when it does get busy, when it does get crazy, when we do need a, a quick meal. Uh, they fuel you up fast with flavorful and nutritious ready to eat meals delivered straight to your door. Takes less than two minutes to cook them. They're fresh, never frozen. Meals ready in two minutes, like I said. Uh, they have calorie conscious options going upscale with some of the things they're offering now, like surf and turf, surf and surf meal options, roasted garlic filet mignon and shrimp and Cajun spiced shrimp and salmon, which is like right in my wheelhouse. This is the kind of stuff I'm all about. So it's got everything for everybody. Uh, there's 34 plus chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options for meals. Uh, you can get snacks, you can get breakfast items. Like it's, it's, it's a great deal. Um, so if you want to get Factor Meals, uh, go to factormeals.com slash hags50 and use the code hags50 to get 50% off of your fir first box. It's a great deal. Uh, you know, I, I've tried it. It's fantastic. I recommend it to you. We love these ready to, to make meal kits, especially when we're, we're on the go with our kids. So one more time, that's factormeals.com slash hags50 to get 50% off your first box. You won't be sorry if you go to factor meals, it gets the hags thumbs up seal of approval. Playoff opponents. It's still undecided as to who the Bruins are going to uh, get. 
They jostle back and forth in first place in the Atlantic Division with Florida. Uh, there's still a, quite a few Eastern Conference teams that are, you know, in shouting distance of of a um, wild card spot, which is, you know, obviously where the Bruins could end up uh, playing if they end up first overall uh, in the East. So, uh, Mark, let Toronto, Tampa, Islanders, Detroit, Capitals, Flyers, those seem to be the teams right now that, you know, might be in the mix depending on how things go. Um who do you think the Bruins should fear the most of all those teams? Who do you think would be the favorable matchups of those teams uh, in a first round uh, potential first round series with the Bruins? Well, I don't know if I would fear Tampa, but I wouldn't want to play Tampa. Uh, mm. They got too many, too many uh, great players there. Some yep. of them on the, you know, some of them maybe obviously on the, uh, not on the downside, but in the second half of their careers with the, a the lot twilight of, of their careers, as they say. Yeah. 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 <laughs> with a lot of playoff miles on them. Yeah. Uh, but in the first round series, I wouldn't want to face, you know, Stamkos and, you know, Kucherov for God's sake. He's not, he's not in the, on the uh, downside of his career. That's for sure. But right. And, you know, a, a very well coached team. I, I wouldn't want anything to do with them. And um, a great goalie in Vasilevsky too. A great like, goalie, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and then they got the Dumba on that team now. Yeah, and and Vasilevsky, you know, missed a lot of time with an injury, so he's not going to be the fatigue factor that sometimes you hit in the playoffs at the end of a long season. Yeah, he's had time off, uh, you know, rehabbing. So there's that. Uh, I think. The team you want to play I, is is Toronto. It'll always be, it'll I agree. Always be Toronto. You know? I agree. Until I, they prove that they can rise to the occasion, uh, the Leafs, that is. Yes. You know, I think that's who you want to play. And they, I don't know. <laughs> they, you know, you watched the game last night, and I, and I didn't watch all of it, but, you know, Samsonov didn't look good in the net. They still have that goalie thing that that they that they don't have yep uh and their d is you know their d is not where it ought to be it, you know because of the their top heavy salaries of their forwards they they just can't afford to do it and and it, you know that's it's an old story there but you know toronto's the team if you're the bruins toronto's the team you want to play i don't think there's any question yeah, it's funny. I was on um, TSN uh, radio station up in Ottawa yesterday before the game, and they were asking me about, you know, the, if the Bruins were, were were trying to avoid playing Toronto in the first round of the playoffs. And I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that's actually the one they'd be looking at and say, I think we'll we'll be good with that one, especially, you know, same old, same old when they played them that, like twice in, what, five or six days or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, and beat them four to one, both uh, there and uh, at home, and and it it you know they, it looks like the same old formula for them. They're, they're you know defense is average at best. They certainly don't have a, a shutdown D that is going to like you know a number one shutdown D that's going to like put the fear of God into you. Like they they build around run and gun, score a lot of goals, regular season points. You know get Austin Matthews seventy million goals. Um, you know, Marner, Matthews, Nylander, all good players. Tavares too. And Morgan Riley's a good defenseman, offensive defense, two-way defenseman, but offensive defenseman. But they don't have the goaltending and defense to be built for playoff success. They just don't. And that is the uh, longstanding legacy of boy genius Kyle Dubas, even after he left, was signing all those guys to massive contracts before they won anything, before they even won a playoff series, yep. you know, showing them all the money and, and sort of building around them as the, the core four that they like to call them up in the Toronto media that, that hasn't done Jack in the post. And, and then he went to Pittsburgh and, and, and double and double down there with signing Eric Carlson, adding him to that aging core. I know. Uh, what a huge risk that was. Um, but a terrible mistake, it seems. So, yeah, I agree. Um, but the one thing I'll say is uh, I think the Leibushkin, uh addition to their defense is going to subtly uh, solidify it. And Riley's a lot better defensively than he used to be. 
Yes. Uh, if Giordano is healthy, he even at 100 years old, I think he's a centurion now, he's he's pretty tough around his own net. Um, I, I just, And he's pretty skilled. Uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not feeling it the way you, I'm sort of feeling a little Bruins Canadians eighties here about this whole thing. And that, and that Toronto's talent is finally going to reverse this thing. And this might be the year. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not really angling toward that, but I agree a hundred percent about avoiding Tampa. Um, I'm not afraid at all the Islanders anymore. Um, um, you got to show up, obviously. We just saw that. Uh, and, uh, and the Flyers, or the Flyers, they're 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 uh, they're building towards something, but it's too soon. Um, yeah, yeah, they, but but I'm not, I'm really not on board with you guys about about the Toronto thing. I'm I, I might be, you might be laughing at me when it happens, but <laughs> but because I mean, I agree with you about the goaltending question uh, until it until it is, it isn't. Um, but uh, but something tells me that that's a powder keg there that finally is going to change. I mean, they got over the hump last year and beat Tampa in the first round. Um, then, you know, obviously felt the Florida uh, more decisively than the Bruins did. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just feeling like this can't last forever. Well, too good. and the other part of the equation too, Mick, is that the Bruins aren't exactly like an infallible, like juggernaut, like they were last year, even if they finish first in the uh, division going into the playoffs, you know, when it comes to beating any of the, like, if they don't like bring it, like they have to bring it in the, in the playoffs right off the get go in the start and, and play their best hockey and, and, you know, show what they've shown in the best spurts this season. Like, I also think any of those teams could beat them in the playoffs. Flyers, Capitals, Red Wings, Islanders, Lightning, or Maple Leafs. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't hold them as, as this, uh, you know, number one seed potentially that's going to like just, you know, take care of any of these teams in four or five games and end and, mm -hmm. and the series. I think they're going to be long drawn out battles in all these playoff series that the Bruins have, because I think there's some things on their, their roster and, and their makeup that other teams are going to be able to exploit when it comes to postseason. The Bruins might use 35 players in these playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I mean, why, you know, when you talked about defensemen, is good. That's when you talk about defensemen and like, you know, hoping Weatherspoon gets in and Shattenkirk gets in and all that stuff. Like, the war of attrition with defensemen, like they're all going to play. I, I have no doubt that all those guys are going to get some time um, down the stretch. And then once the playoffs start. And, and probably 15 forwards. Yeah, exactly. It'll um, be a little like the late eighties Bruins. Uh, Mick, uh, uh, Mark, anything, any thoughts on any of the other teams besides Tampa and Toronto that I mentioned? The Islanders, despite their personnel uh, short, shortcomings uh patrick wah and, and you know what he uh yeah what he'd like to be able to bring uh that's true makes me a little nervous just a little bit a little yeah bit, yeah you know yeah, uh and then they one. have a goalie who's capable of uh yep heating up and and uh and and stealing a series uh you know Although in the games I've watched recently, he's been kind of leaky. But uh, yeah, but you're making a great point, Mark, because Patrick Waugh just went in the papers and said that he's not pleased with Sorokin, yeah. and that and that they've and so this has been a conversation in New York, and and I think this is Patrick Waugh doing that thing. He's yeah. he's he's taking an action here, and being a goalie, he understands how goalies think, and so. Uh, this is really interesting juncture right now for them because if all of a sudden Sorokin gets pissed off and catches fire here, then the Islanders, the whole way you look at them changes. Yeah, I mean he's when he's on top of his game, he's as good as anyone, you yeah. know. And uh, yeah, if uh, if uh, Patrick can light a fire under him, then uh, then you know who knows uh, who knows what could happen. Selfishly, I would just also uh, have a lot of fun covering a first round series where either Patrick Roy or John Tortorella was the other coach uh, oh, involved, in that, the brother. <laughs> involved in the series. Those are always fun and it adds a level of uh, drama and intrigue and, uh, you know, unexpected uh, element to all the press conferences and all the, you know, the the day to day uh, availabilities and practice and games uh, in, in a two week series like that. So I, I hope it's either one of them. 
Uh, and it's a great point, Mark, about Patrick Roy. Like him against the Bruins in a playoff series. Like, yeah, how it's awesome just, would that be? Yeah, it just uh, it it just makes you a little nervous uh, having seen what we we've, we've seen uh, through the years. Uh, as far as Torts goes, you know, doesn't he have to coach the Bruins at some point in his career? Doesn't, <laughs> doesn't that have to happen? I think so. I, I used to you know? think that about Peter Laviolette, but we haven't seen either, have we? I, mean, I don't know. Torts turned just, down three times. Torts is just so entertaining and so himself that yeah. uh, you know the Bruins. Not that I'm wishing. Uh, but do the Bruins hire coaches like that anymore? Either you know, like I don't know that they. Well, yeah, they don't. Know. Harry you know? Sinden. Harry Sinden would have done it. He would have. Uh, no, they oh, don't. Yeah, definitely. They don't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, boy, that would be fun. That you know, if they, if they, I think the only way like a guy like that would get hired by Don Sweeney is if they felt like it got so comfortable in that room that they needed to bring somebody in that was an ass kicker to yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. make everybody uncomfortable. Like, and you know, that the, the stuff that you talked about with like, I don't know if it was like a softer touch, but whatever the, the, yeah, I remember the talk when they went from Bruce uh, Butchie to um, Jim Montgomery you know, and, and kind of a different messaging and a different approach. Like if they had to like go the opposite route again and find some and go, go, you know, from zero to 60 in the other direction and find somebody that was just going to come in and be a drill sergeant type, um, you know, then maybe, then maybe torts would make sense, but I, I have a hard time seeing Don Sweeney, like saying, uh, <laughs> this is our man, John Tortorella to come in and coach the Bruins. Yeah. It's, it'll never happen. It'll never, <laughs> it'll never happen. But wouldn't it be great if it did? It would yeah. be. It would be. Um, tweet of the week uh, from J Simi sixty six. Yes, Pasternak had a hard hat trick, but he, he. But the real question is, will Pasternak perform in the playoffs? I hope so because he has not been great come springtime. Now, I, I don't think this is necessarily fair, um, but uh, like, has he been a guy that's gotten a ton of hat tricks in the playoffs and has exploded in a series and taken it over? Um, no, uh, to, to, to a large degree, but he's still got 79 points in 77 playoff games. If you're a point per game player in the playoffs, you're doing pretty well. Um, but this will be an interesting playoff, uh, I think, uh, opportunity coming up this spring for Pasternak, given how well he, he's played in the last couple of, um, years, given where he's at in his stage of his career at his age. Um, the stage is set for him to really have like a superstar uh, Stanley Cup playoff this spring uh, and help carry this team if they're going to get there. You well, know how old we are? What's We're that? so old no. that Pasternak has only one more playoff in his 20s after this. Yeah. He's been around a while. <laughs> I I still think of I'm looking at I'm looking I'm looking up his playoff stats here so I can try to make an intelligent comment so that's what I came up with first. Yeah, um, 79 points in 77 playoff games. So like he's a point per game player in the playoffs. He scored yeah, five I mean, goals in seven games last year. Yeah. Mark, what are you going to say? 3 and 3 against Carolina. 7 8 and 11 games he was seven goals, eight assists against the uh, Capitals and the Islanders. And then 10 points under the bubble and 19 and 24. 18, yep. he ripped it up, but he's been very good. Yeah. I don't, I don't get this. Yeah. Um, Mark, I care we... more about him not making any, any bad, desperate attempts to make an offensive play at the end of a shift and costing them. That's what worries me. Yeah. And I worry about it a lot less than I used to. Mark, what were you going to say? I think that the the heat that pasta takes uh, on the on the radio in the afternoon between two and six skews, yeah, skews things a bit. Uh, yeah, you know, in the among the fan base, it, you know, it's not the uh, it's the sky isn't falling. Uh, you know, like some would uh, portray it. He, he's, you know, a point per game in the playoffs. You know, who wouldn't take that? So I, I think, uh, yeah, he's got to, obviously every year is a different year. He's He's got to deliver this year, but, uh, you know, I, I think he takes too much heat for that. And, uh, 
And I think a lot of it goes back to uh, the criticism he takes on the airwaves uh, in the afternoon. I think that's a great point, Mark, because I think the only way they generate heat when they talk about the Bruins is by like, uh, you know, criticizing Pasternak and, uh, you know, last year, I think was right. He was a 60 goal score and they were talking about taking him off the power play. That was their big thing that uh, Felger was talking about for long periods of time. So, well, and yeah, they should, you know, somebody says uh, once in a while, ah, they, he makes a mistake. Ah, he needs to watch from the press box next game. You know? <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Right. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a smart take. Um, yeah. Every NHL coach in this day and age knows if you put Pasternak in the press box, you're going to be in the uh, unemployment line looking for a job pretty soon afterwards if you're an yeah. NHL head coach. Yeah. That's the way it works in in, in that league these, these days. Um, Mick Collagio, Mark Diver, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. Uh, let's thank our sponsor. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Instead of battling thousands of other players, it could be pros or sharks. You simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll right in. For example, David Posternak, you pick shots on net, you pick goals in the playoffs. Yeah, maybe you pick hat tricks. Uh, perhaps you could even pick a uh, number of bear hats picked up off the ice during a game. Who knows? Um, or Charlie McAvoy block shots, hits, all kinds of things like that. You pick more or less. It's fun and pretty simple. Download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first time deposit match of up to $100. That's download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match of up to $100. <laughs> 